You can read a lot more about our guest preacher this morning on page 7 of your weekly or just by Googling or Wikipedia her name and you will find out so much about her. For those of you who are regulars here at Cathedral of Hope, you know that on a Sunday morning it is very rare for me to yield the pulpit and still be in the building. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is there is no one to whom I would wish to yield this pulpit to more than Bishop Yvette Flunder. Yvette and I have known each other for many years, and in the time that we have known each other, we have worked together on many projects. We've worked on being a spiritual voice in what is often a wilderness. Her and I, and when we were in California specifically, worked tirelessly on Proposition 8 and helping both the LGBT community and the religious community to understand what it means when we use the word family to create new families and to affirm all families. We have been exciting to journey together and when I first asked Bishop if she would come and preach at Cathedral, her quick and resounding answer was yes. And two years later, I found myself on her calendar. <laughs> Friends, I know that you are in for a treat this morning, so buckle up. Sit back, don't get too comfortable, because there is an uncomfortable, inconvenient word that is about to hit us this morning. Please join me in welcoming our bishop, Bishop Yvette Flunder. God bless. And so I'm going to take a bit of liberty in as much as this is the rowdier of the two services <laughs> that happen here at the cathedral. And I've also asked my colleagues and in so many ways sons in the gospel work about their opinion uh, Bishop Bird and, and Pastor Marvin, could I sing a little bit today? And so they said, go ahead. Yes, so, so there's just a, a verse and a chorus of a song that's in my spirit, and I want to share it with you because this is a tenuous time still for a lot of our folks that have been disadvantaged by not having paychecks for the last two pay periods. Uh, many of the workers will get their money. The contractors will not. They will not get their money. And there are some folks who have had to leave their jobs because they had to do something else in order to feed their families. And there was a song that came up in my spirit, and just the chorus of it, this, this is the song. It says, God gives more grace as your burden grow greater and God sends more strength as your labors increase and to added affliction God adds mercy and to multiplied trial, God adds multiplied peace. And when we have exhausted, hallelujah, our own store of endurance, have you ever felt like your strength was about to fail and your task is just begun and when we have depleted our own hearts of resources 
That's when God's full giving is only begun. God's love, God's love has no limit, hallelujah. And God's grace has no measure. And God's power has no boundaries known unto man. For out of, out of God's infinite And then keeps on giving, my God giveth. And then keeps on giving, I like that part. My God giveth. And then God giveth. Oh, again. Strength for the journey. And my grandmother used to say, I trust in God, I won't take nothing for my journey. I know what she meant, because these are complicated times. And I'm learning to lean. A hymn writer said on Jesus, and I'm finding more power than I've ever dreamed. Just learning to lean on Jesus. And Jesus stood up to read in the synagogue. They had in their synagogues usually seven readers during his time. Every Sabbath, the first a priest, the second a Levite, and the other five Israelites, always men, in the synagogue, read. We often find Christ preaching in other synagogues, but never reading apart from this passage, except in his home synagogue in Nazareth. Jesus had a home synagogue in Nazareth, which he had been aligned with, we suspect, for many years. He'd been a member. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew. He was never a Christian. <laughs> and he was a Palestinian Jew in good standing. He offered his Sabbath service as he had perhaps often done. He didn't seem to have been a stranger. And he read one of the lessons out of the prophets from the book of Isaiah which was likely delivered to him on a scroll, either by the ruler of the synagogue or by the minister. And they went to Isaiah 61 and 1, and they didn't have them numbered like we do, you know. <laughs> he had to read from the scroll. It was likely pointed out so that he would be in the correct order, reading from the right place on that day. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Spirit has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. The Spirit of the Lord sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the covering of recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book or rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant 
and sat down. And this was the peculiar thing. And all the eyes of those in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And then he said to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Essentially, before today, we read from the book. But today, the announcement I want to make to you is I am the book. I am called not just to read it, but to be it. Jesus had just returned from John's baptism and Satan's temptation. Been in the wilderness where the devil, where Satan, where the evil one tempted him to abuse his power and to use his influence to his own gain. He was now attending his home synagogue in the ghetto. Nazareth. They said nothing good comes out of Nazareth. He's kind of like on the other side of the tracks, the way people think of Southside Chicago. <laughs> Nazareth. And he stood and he read from the scroll, the scroll, again, the Spirit is upon me. How do I know that the Spirit is upon me? Because the evidence of the Spirit being upon me is the Spirit has called me to give good tidings to the poor. And let me make an aside here, because this suggests that where there are not good tidings for the poor, there is no presence of God's Spirit. When he read it and rolled it up, gave it to the minister, sat down, and their eyes were still fixed on him, they knew something different had occurred something more than the oft-repeated words of Isaiah. I suspect that they, like us, could feel something was going on. There was some shift in the atmosphere because they'd heard Isaiah's words read over and over and over again. But Jesus was suggesting that he had a new way to read history, not just to read from the book, but to become the book. The promise is now fulfilled in his entrance upon public ministry. Now, the report that they heard of his preaching and miracles in other places had turned into the now. Anybody understand that? You've heard from other people what God can do, but it gets real different when it visits you and you begin to have an experience. Jesus said now, I know you've heard about this and that, but now in this place, in this synagogue, in this preaching, in this now moment, I'm about to let you know what God is about to do now. We're not talking in the past tense about what God has done. We're talking about what God is doing in your sight now. Isaiah said in Isaiah 29 and 1, worthy is the lamb that was slain to take the book and open the seals, for he can open, not the book only, but the understanding. Hallelujah. I tell you, because I've had this experience, when Jesus spoke of paradise in the conversation, this sort of idea and vision of a coming time, a paradise, an experience of Jubilee. He was suggesting to them that the Jubilee is sitting here in this synagogue with you today. Paradise. This peculiar reality where the lion lays down with the lamb, first of all, is not typical. And as we say often, and it's said to our community, it ain't natural. <laughs> For a lion to lay down with a lamb. The reason it is supernatural is the lion and the lamb must simultaneously surrender some part of how they are perceived to be in the world. The lion must give up its tendency to be a predator, but the lamb must give up its tendency to be prey. When the lion lay down with the lamb, it's a miracle. When paradise 
really comes from the heart of God into the earth. When Jubilee really begins to really be evidenced in the earth, a miracle is taking place. Jesus was suggesting it's kicking off right here today. And I want to say something to you, Cathedral. It's kicking off right here in this room today. 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 This is paradise. We claim it to be so, not in the future, but in the place where the Spirit is. Jesus set the tone for the role of the church in the earth. Consider the text. He read from the book, he gave it back, he said, I am the book. Let me say it again. He read from the book, he gave it back, sat down and said, I am the book. I'm gonna say it again till you get it. He read from the book, he gave it back, sat down, said, I am the book. And perhaps like Jesus, some of us need to put the text down for a minute and understand that the intention of God is that we would become the book. Why do I say that? Because I was the champion. I got the ribbon all the time for being in the Bible drill at our church. I could quote all the books of the Bible backwards and forwards. And that was quite an achievement coming along in the church. And I used to call them the ayahs, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of them. I could quote them all backwards and forwards. It didn't mean that I understood them, but I could quote them. And I know a lot of people that quote and don't understand the essence of the heart and purpose of God. They got the book down. In fact, they have learned it so well until whatever it is they don't want you to do or be, they can go find some scripture for it. Am I right about that? Am I right about that? Yeah. And there's something in there to help them. <laughs> and it all depends on your hermeneutic. I thought about it this morning. It all depends on your hermeneutic. If you have a, a hermeneutic of slavery, I, there's something in there for you. If you got a hermeneutic to hate women, there's something in there for you. If you got a hermeneutic against gay people, you can find you something. If you got a hermeneutic against whatever you got a hermeneutic against, how am I doing with that? There's something in there. It depends on the way you go to the book. That's why the book doesn't have a right essentially to speak the heart of God in all things because first you must find the heart of God. Then you can go back to the text and know when God wrote it and when somebody else did it in God's name. Yeah. The word of God. What does it mean, the word of God? Jesus said, you're looking at it. If I was in a Pentecostal church, I'd tell you, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> tell your neighbor, you're looking at the Word of God. There are words about God. Come on now. Theos Logos, there are words about God. Hallelujah. But the Word of God, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What is the Word? God. What do we have the opportunity to embody? The Word of God manifested in us and through us. I come from a people that knew God who were functionally illiterate. <laughs> but they knew God. And you could tell them something and say, well, God wants you to this and God wants you to that. They said, no, God doesn't. Yes, God does. No, God doesn't. How do you know? Because I know God. Something very powerful. Consider the text then. Jesus says, I am the book. It is more important to be the book than to quote the book. What happened that day was likely similar to what happens among us. When Jesus made this declaration, some people got excited and said, isn't this Joe the carpenter's son? We hear he's become a wonder out in the suburbs. <laughs> And he's back home in the synagogue right here, our synagogue. So come here, Jesus, heal my camel. <laughs> come here, Jesus. I'm having some trouble with the tax collectors, the IRS of their day. Come here, Jesus. 
Set us free from this Roman Empire. Take back David's throne. Restore us to power. Do some miracles and stuff. Because we've heard that you can. Jesus said, I, the reason I came out of the wilderness, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me to give good tidings to the poor. My purpose is to be the fleshly representation of God's intention for humanity in the earth. That is our task. That is the role of the church. That is what we are responsible to do. Somebody said, take back David's throne, if you're really all that, Jesus. But the truth is, when we are lifted and lofty, it is because we are bringing good tidings to the poor. I can hear Jesus responding to the church world today. See, this is why I cannot do what I'm sent to do. Because you all want to know the book, but you don't want to know me. You all want to have fine and good and powerful looking stuff with no substance and no power. You're struggling about things that do not matter. You've been politicized and captivated. You've become elitist and indifferent. Not here, certainly not here. But there are a few people in a few places for whom this is the word. <laughs> like how to achieve greatness at other people's expense. Like developing church is competitive big business. Worrying about maintaining status and reputation. Fear that being prophetic and speaking truth will cost at the offering table. Worried more about looking good than doing justice. I'm preaching now. I know what I'm preaching. Self-imposed convenient theological ignorance. Self-imposed, convenient, theological ignorance. Really troubling. People who go through seminary and they know, and they know, but they won't tell the people what they know. Because if the people know what they know, then that keeps the clergy from being elitist. Does anybody understand? Self-imposed, convenient, scientific ignorance. When you know better, come on now, and you know better and you learn better, and you know better, but you keep defaulting to what really are the things that people want to hear. Hear me now. Self-imposed, convenient, scientific, and oppressive religions that demonize and vilify all that came before them, particularly ones that have historically targeted indigenous people and indigenous faith as though our ancestors, my Igbo ancestors, and my Cherokee ancestors, and my Celtic ancestors were not people of God. God by any name is still God. Amen. Hallelujah. Still God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God is still God. And so Jesus read the book. And then Jesus gave it back and sat down and said, I am the book. Put the book down for a minute and realize what it is for. Hallelujah. And understand that God, if God wants to, can do a new thing. Anybody got that? Somebody said to me once, said, well, you and Shirley, Shirley and I have been together 34 years. They said, you all can't be in the will of God. You can't be in the will of God because the Bible says, said, stop for a minute. Shirley and I aren't in the Bible. <laughs> we don't have a, an example of two women that loved one another for 34 years and made a life God married. Do you understand what I'm saying? Raised some children and, a, and one of them is a bishop and the other one's a gospel music artist. Anybody understand what I'm saying? We don't have an example for that. But that's okay. I'm here. And I exist. I'm impossible, but I'm possible. The truth of the matter is a whole lot of things. The internet's not in the Bible, but we believe in the internet. We believe in it. Some of us would drop dead if you took Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. Come on. Twitter, we would drop dead today. This would be our last breathing day on earth if we didn't have it. 
But the people who say that they don't believe in me already have a preconceived pejorative assumption of how God feels about me. And I need to say to you, my beloved, God can do whatever God wants to do. The greatest mistake humankind ever made was to try to fix God into a book. They put a back cover. We should never have put a back cover on the book because God is still speaking fresh word from God. And so I'm not here to talk about church's big business. I'm here to let you know that I appreciate everything God is doing through us and for us, as long as we remember that we are called to be the book. How you are is much more than what you've read and quote. And sometimes when I'm teaching preaching in the schools, I ask my students, now preach what it is that you believe and don't quote not one verse from the text. No scripture, no line, no, don't go and grab anybody. Tell us what you know based on your walk and can you find a word from inside of you? The way that you quote what writers said that they understood about God. Essentially, what is God saying to you and how is God requiring you to conduct your life in the earth? Breathe in the word of God, Theos Logos. Breathe in, because in the beginning, it was the word. Don't get stuck on the book and get disconnected from the word. Oh, you need to hear me, beloved. Don't get stuck on churchology and get disconnected from spirit. Don't get stuck on how your blood family will not receive you and forget God's got a family for you. Amen. Don't get stuck on the ridiculousness of our government and forget that God is still large and in charge. Does anybody understand? <laughs> So how about this Jesus of the book? Who is this Jesus? And what would this Jesus have us do? Well, Jesus did some stuff during his time that was counterculture. He broke with things. He met that woman at the well. Come on now. And she was not typically in her custom to be traveling alone. Come on. An odd hour at night, a single man, single woman, you know the people talked. <laughs> met the woman at the well. What did Jesus do with the woman who had an issue of blood? Come on. What did Jesus do with the man at the pool at Bethsaida? What did Jesus do with Mary in the living room while Martha was in the kitchen? And a woman's role was not to recline with the men to talk about the things of God. It was to fry chicken. But Jesus... <laughs> broke with tradition and made the woman welcome and told her sister, leave her alone. She has chosen the better part. His diverse following, the impact of their presence, it had an impact on his reputation because the, the people said Jesus hangs out with people who drink and people who eat too much. And you never read anywhere where Jesus turned and said, no, I don't, I don't, I don't. I hang with them, but I'm not really like them. You know, I just, <laughs> I just be with them because they need help. No, I don't think that he cared much that he had the reputation. I can hear him saying, show you right. That's right. He's mine. He's my homies. He's the ones that I spend time with. I enjoy their company just like they enjoy mine. It's since he didn't feel that people that society thought less of would diminish his situation and his authority and his hands and his feet and his heart were connected to human beings in a human situation. Jesus was walking around in the flesh. I wonder where would he be now? What kind of thing would he attack to, attach to? What kind of thing would this Palestinian Jew be doing right now in our time? I can see him 
sitting at tables with us working on the issues of human sexuality, working on the issues of substance abuse and homelessness. I can see Jesus saying, we got to do more than provide tents. Come on now. We've got to do something to help people help themselves. Come on. I can see Jesus talking about the issues of death, about gun violence and empire and access to health care and the prison industrial complex. I can see him dealing with us with our exceptionalism. Come on now. And those of us that feel like because we were bought or born into it that we have the opportunity to be in a higher place with God. God loves us. Manifest destiny. Anybody understand what I'm saying? God favors us somehow because we're us. I can see Jesus saying, get down off that high horse and go help somebody. I can see Jesus doing that. I can see that happening. I can see it. I can see him rolling up with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt on. I can see Jesus. That's in a pink hat at the same time. I can see Jesus doing that work. The issues and dealing with the issues of church folks in denial. Hear me today. Be the book. At Starbucks, be the book. At Walmart, at Super Walmart, be the book. On your job. Be the book on public transportation. Be the book everywhere you go, because you just never know. Be kind. Be generous with your compliments. Learn how to treat people like you want to be treated, because that is much more holy than quoting scripture. Be the book everywhere we go. What did it prophetically cost him to, be the, to show up and speak truth to power? He was so busy being it, you know, Jesus never wrote anything. Everything was written about him. He never wrote anything that we know of. But folks wrote about him because he was so busy being it. Come on, hear me. He was so busy being it. What did it cost him? It cost him everything. What will it cost us? It will cost us everything. But do it, cross the line, take the risk. Put yourself in harm's way. Go up in the attic and get your Birkenstocks and your signs down. Get in one of these marches again. Make some noise. Don't just leave it to other people. Get out there and be the book because the sick still need healers. And the poor still need champions. And this time is in need of a living word because in many ways, organized church on the right has in so many ways abdicated its moral authority. And the question is, who will get in the gap, stand in the gap and make up the hedge? What I've learned is that you don't have to lay down with the devil in order to please God. And there are people that have laid down, I know, I know I got to quit, have laid down with evil in our time. And they have done it, they said, because this is what God wants. I said, no, test it out. God has never had to get in league with evil to do good. God knows how to do good because God is good. Hey, hallelujah. The God I serve is an awesome God. Hallelujah. Who can do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. And I've got Pentecostals coming up, so let me sit down. <laughs> God needs some champions, and the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Yeah. Let me say it again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. And God has anointed you to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, set the captives free, and set the oppressed free, and speak truth to power and do the work that you are called to do. Don't keep handing it off to someone else. But do what God has called you to do, sisters, brothers, siblings, in this time, when so many have compromised the gospel to defend evil in order to keep their status, their money, their reputation, and their power. God needs some prophets, hallelujah, who will speak without fear and compromise the gospel message to defend us from evil. God is calling 
for some walking, talking, marching, fighting, sometimes cussing. <laughs> Books. Be the book. God bless. <laughs>